Joining us now is Dr. Dwayne Elmore, Associate Professor of Natural Resource Ecology and Management. Well, Dwayne, I know one of the things that you've been working to educate um, people of Oklahoma about is prescribed fire. Tell us about what it is and why it's practiced. Sure. Well, prescribed fire is just uh, purposely uh, starting a fire to meet some management objective. And that could be for livestock production, it could be for wildlife objectives, it could be to control certain um, fire intolerant plants. Um, so there's a lot of different people that would use prescribed fire in Oklahoma. Uh, livestock producers commonly do, wildlife managers do, mm -hmm. and in some cases people that are just trying to encourage uh, plant biodiversity on a prairie site. Yeah, we visited a tall grass prairie in Oklahoma. That would be a place where it's used just to manage, well, they also have bison too. Absolutely. Yeah. To manage the bison, but also the native pr uh, prairie plants. Sure. Well, at this station here, uh, you experiment with different um, prescribed fires to manage for, for all three of those things, wildlife, plant diversity, and uh, cattle. In That's this correct. Case. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this site is a little different from a lot of traditional uses of fire in that the whole pastures are not burned mm -hmm. at once. Uh, they'll take a pasture and burn portions of it and which influences livestock distribution so the, the grazing animals usually concentrate on those burned areas so you get other areas that are uh, essentially rested for some period of time until it's, it's burned and what you see when you have that uh, differential fire and the grazing is that you get a lot of diversity in plant structure but also plant composition. You see uh, really dramatic forb flushes the year following a fire and, and then a year at, uh, even beyond um, that over time will fade as grass begins to dominate that prairie site again and it's just very dynamic. So you have kind of a patchwork of different age stands within the prairie. That's correct that. and, and it's always different you know every year is going to be a little bit different mm -hmm. uh, just based on the precip and how long it's been since that site was burned and grazed. Okay. What are some of the plants that you start to see come out uh, like the first year after you've burned? Typically annuals uh, okay. and lots of broadleaf plants and some of which aren't necessarily really showy plants, but mm -hmm. they are important plants for a lot of wildlife species, things like ragweed and broomweed and crotons. Um, so, you know, and, and then also you'll start to see by the second year, you know, perennials mm -hmm. begin to dominate the site. And some of those can be quite showy, uh, you know, ec echinaceas and, and uh, liatris, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it's just constantly changes. Yeah, and I've seen um, even as we move across this site, the plant community shift. Um, mm -hmm. You know, here we have a lot of grasses behind us, but in front, uh, there's a lot more forbs, and even the forbs here are changing. Yeah, they do. All, every week, there's a whole new suite of forbs, broadleaf mm -hmm. plants, and legumes that are that are blooming on this site, and we're kind of walking into a shallow soil site here, so it's mm -hmm. a, a different ecological. Uh, site. It's basically uh, there's sandstone mm -hmm. really close to the surface here. There's a lot of surface rock, it's real rock. a lot more bare ground, and a lot of uh, forbs, uh, specifically several species of dahlia that we're looking yeah. at. Yeah, they're really fun to see those little pockets come up. Absolutely. But uh, Dwayne, in terms of the plant community that you find, what's the benefit of burning it in patches instead of burning it all at once, or even just simply not burning? Okay. Well, if you don't burn at all, uh, these prairies will eventually uh, transition into a woodland. And in this part of the state, what's going to happen is you're going to get a juniper woodland like we see on this hill over your back. Uh, so eastern red cedar yeah. is going to increase. It is a fire intolerant native plant, mm -hmm. but when it increases, uh, it shades out a lot of these uh, shade um, intolerant species, primarily the, the grasses but also some of the broadleaf plants. And so you'll start to see a whole different plant community without fire. Now when you introduce fire, you control eastern red cedar and you maintain prairie areas. So the difference in burning the whole prairie versus patches of the prairie is if you have grazing in the mix, when you only burn portions of the prairie, those livestock typically follow the fire and spend most of their time on those recently why burned they, patches. Yeah, why do they do that? It's because the grasses have higher crude protein content is the primary reason okay. that nutrition. that's happening. Nutrition. That nutrition. Yeah, so they spend a lot of their time on those areas that were recently burned. And what we'll see is plants that are very uh, uh, grazing sensitive 
might start to decline if you burn the whole prairie like that. But if you burn portions and concentrate them, then it gives different species a chance to be on that prairie under different uh, grazing intensities. Okay, and we have a little patch of some of those yeah, plants. Yeah, you want to go look at those? Yeah. Along this roadside, we're looking at three plants that you commonly see in ditches outside of grazed areas, and that's compass plant, lead plant, mm -hmm. and uh, Maximilian sunflower. You rarely see those plants out in pastures that have livestock, and it's because they're really desirable forages, and mm -hmm. livestock graze them and they typically decline, or we have uh, grazing. Uh, even when the areas are burned and then grazed, they typically decline. Now, an exception to that, something we've seen on this research, where we're burning just portions of this pasture, and like I was saying earlier, where the livestock are concentrating on subunits or patches within these pastures, and these other patches have some rest, then we're starting to see those really ice cream plants mm -hmm. start to move back out into these uh, areas that the livestock do have access to. So kind of mixing up the fire and grazing management in that way, it really does change the composition of the plant community. And those are all three uh, very unique and showy very flowers beautiful. that are nice for the garden as well. Yeah, you have another one that's a real nice plant for the garden. Let's go take a look. Okay. This is another magnificent flower. I think yeah. it would be great in a garden setting. This is ironweed, right? This is ironweed. Specifically, this is Baldwin's ironweed. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty common across Oklahoma. A lot of people are, are seeing it in midsummer. It's real showy. Great plants, tough as nails, drought tolerant, and pollinating insects really like it a lot. And that's a perennial, right? It so is. So we'll get to enjoy it year after year. That's correct. Before we leave, I wanted to point out one last plant, and that's a thistle. And thistles have such a bad reputation, mm -hmm. but we have some native ones as well. This is a native. This mm -hmm. is wavy leaf thistle. It is not invasive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a gorgeous plant, and it's pretty recognizable. It usually stays fairly short, mm -hmm. uh, shorter than the um, musk thistle musk and Canada thistle thistles. Can get up pretty tall. Yeah, and it kind of has this powdery uh, on the leaf coating. Yeah. So it's kind of distinct. Mm -hmm. it, um, it's also a great plant for pollinating insects. Beetles and, and lots of moths and butterflies really are attracted to the nectar. Excellent. Well, this is a really amazing, uh, diverse ecosystem. I'm so glad to see it with you. I'm glad you came.